right, very good. Look in your Bibles, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we'll begin today. I'll give you just a few moments here of introduction and then possibly even reminding you of some things we've considered before here regarding the church in Corinth, which I think is very important to being able to see the tremendous need that they had and the weakness that's exposed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can we, Father, again, we come to you. Lord, we are mindful today of your faithfulness and your goodness to us and your great love. What a love. And uh, Lord, if we could take a, a pen and if the ocean were full of ink and the sky were a parchment, as the songwriter wrote, we could not, and it would not contain everything that we could write about you and about your love. Lord, we desire today not just to simply define love, but we desire today to recognize and experience your love. We trust now, Lord, that you'll move in our hearts and do something that only you can do, and that is work with the inner man. Build us today and help us. And Lord, if there's one today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, might they recognize your great love. Might they see today that great gift that you have given in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again, that we might have forgiveness of sins, victory over death, and eternal life. Help us now, Lord, to be attentive to what you'd have for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord sent the Apostle Paul to Corinth on one of his missionary journeys. When he went there, he found a, uh, a busy city. He found a city that was somewhat on the decline. Uh, there had been other cities that were building up around it. It was at that time even somewhat antiquated, but still full of a lot of activity. With the activity in Corinth, there also came great sin. It was known culturally, even in writings, for those who at that time period, they would use the term a Corinthian or Corinthianize to describe great levels of debauchery or iniquity. For example, those that would give themselves in prostitution. That word it was also interchangeable at times with the term Corinthian or people of Corinth. We think in our culture today of cities, unfortunately in our country, that somewhat have some taglines alongside of them. When we think of a particular cities, there are things that come to our mind that are not necessarily things that would be pleasing to God. For example, when we hear the, the city Las Vegas, we don't think of godliness when we think of Las Vegas. As a child, there were particular cities that were emerging as becoming hotbeds for wickedness and lewdness. And when you would hear that, you would think of that. And that was somewhat the case with the church in Corinth. And it bears out that uh, where the gospel went, people got saved. Uh, but boy, they had problems. You know, the reality is today in this generation, the gospel still works. The Lord's still in the soul-saving business, right? And we ought to be big on the gospel and preaching the gospel and then explaining the gospel, right? Uh, telling somebody what it means to be saved and then what it is to be saved. And we have spent some time on Wednesday evenings talking about living victorious for the Lord, recognizing our position in Christ, recognizing what that means and how do I walk in that? How do I, on a daily basis, allow that to affect my life? And so there's so much to that. And so the gospel went there, and man, it made a difference. People got saved. But then in this church that began to gather, where seemingly there, were, there was growth and attendance, and there were even people who were demonstrating gifts of God that were in their life to be able to facilitate this church. But there was problems. Uh, so much were the problems that the Lord used the Apostle Paul to write that we have recorded for our uh, learning two letters, First and Second Corinthians, and uh, not First Corinth, right, as we've heard it repeated before, but we, we call it First and Second Corinthians. And possibly even other letters are referenced having been sent to this same church. Because they had problems. Some of the problems that they experienced, they experienced great division. There was a blending of people groups in the church in Corinth. There was all sorts of people from various backgrounds there who had uh, brought into Christianity, brought into their salvation. They brought in different thoughts on things. There were people who had worshipped idols before. There were people who had had nothing to do with idols. There were people who were deeply offended when somebody would offer meat to an idol as a sacrifice. They were offended that other people would then come along and buy that meat and eat that meat. And that was a, a grievance to folks. They were divided in who they liked. Some said, I'm of Paul. Some said, I'm of Cephas. Some said, I'm of Jesus. 
they were divided maybe in how people thought. You know, somebody's a little more like me, or they're, they're from where I'm from, or their language is more like my language. And so there was division. And listen, there's always something for God's people to be divided about. Always something. Some personality, some issue. There was problems there also with sin. There was known sin. There was something that was going on in the church that was so grievous that it's even referenced that the world would look at that and would deal with that. And it wasn't just that there was sin there. It was that it was known sin. And people just went along with it and functioned as if it was just part of things. And the church was being dealt with in their approach towards sin as well as the people who were involved in it. Sin. There were problems in marriages. Impurity. Difficulty with Christian liberty. They were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. Now, listen. It's a tremendous picture, in a sense, even of what the Lord did with Israel when He brought them out of Egypt. It took them a long time to get Egypt out of them. And that's that growth in grace. Now listen, for those of us that have been around a little while and you were brought up in church and you were brought up around the things of God, you were brought up, brought up with good values, there was a time culturally in our country where in our public schools, those schools that are funded with your tax dollars, there was morality taught. There was good standards of living and good expectation in life. I, I, I hate to say this and it grieves me, but it's the truth. Culturally, we've shifted away from good morals and good standards. And so what's going to happen is we win people and we reach people in this generation, which we should because the gospel still works. And the gospel still needs to be shared is that people are coming now, in some cases, from radically different upbringings and backgrounds that we've come from. It was very clear to me right and wrong as a child. It was very clear to me and very evident in society. That was the expected standard of right and wrong. It wasn't that there was the absence of sin, but we knew what sin was. And when a person was involved in it, they would at least say, I'm involved in sin. I know that it's wrong, but I'm still involved in it. Now we have flipped the script. Now we proclaim that which is righteous as being unrighteous, and we've declared that which is unrighteous to be righteous. And young people are being indoctrinated in that. They're being brought up in that. That's what they're seeing. And boy, we're going to take the gospel into this, our world, our country, door to door, house to house, corner to corner, and reach people. We need to know where they're coming from. And just like this church in Corinth, there's going to be issues. I am dealing with things now with people that if you had told me 30 years ago when I was in training to be a minister, I'd have said there's no way in the world I would ever need to have that conversation or deal with that. Everybody knows that that's. But we know that people are confused and the enemy is working overtime to bring confusion in. And this church in Corinth, there was confusion, there was problems. The first thing I want to say to you is this, aren't you glad that God didn't give up on them? Aren't you glad that God sent them the Apostle Paul and God sent them letters through Paul and God was working with them and trying to bring them along and bring them out of that? We're called to be long-suffering. We're called to be patient. We're called to continue on and to persevere. And I want to challenge you, uh, some of us that have lived a little bit longer than others and we have a, 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 what I would say is a more biblical bearing in our life and that's what we were brought up in and established in. Let's not throw folks out and throw folks away just simply because they've not been taught. Let's help them. Let's love them. Let's reach them. Let's preach the gospel. Let's teach them truth. Let's go to our field that God has given us. This church in Corinth, because of these problems, uh, division and uh, impurity and a violation of liberty, they just, they just didn't function well. And one of the areas that this really began to be exposed in was in the areas of gifts and what God was wanting to do in the church. People were beginning to use this incorrectly. They were finding gifts as a thing of pride and a thing of position rather than ministering the way that God called them to. Chapter 12 and chapter 14 deal with gifts. And I'm not getting into all the gifts and the discussion on tongues I have in my Sunday school class in time past. I'd be glad to have that discussion with you at some point. But there was things that were happening in the church and when the Lord was establishing the gospel and getting the gospel rooted in and giving signs to that for Jewish believers. And there was a carryover here even into this church where things were happening and taking place that were of God. But the problem was, when you take a person who does not love God or have a love for other people and you give them a gift, 
they can begin to use that gift for what? For self-gratification. For position. And this passage of Scripture really cuts to the heart of the matter what was going on in the church of Corinth, and I'm afraid even at times in our lives. I don't stand in judgment of you today, nor do you stand in judgment of me. I answer to the Lord Jesus Christ, as do you. And I would ask you today very sincerely, as I'm speaking to you from God's Word, and I'll do the very best humanly that I can, but these are this is truth of such depth and such importance that we need the Lord's help in this. We need the Lord to direct us in here and to really do a work in our heart. Because I'm not going to just seek today to give you a definition of love. I want us today to really experience or to see God's love in action. For example, I gave a couple of illustrations this morning. Bear with me in the 9 o'clock service. If I gave you the definition today of what a Chevrolet Corvette is, I would tell you the year that it was first made. I would tell you the designer. I would tell you that it's a sports car. I would tell you maybe the production numbers. I would tell you that it's a two-seater. I would tell you that for many years it was a front-engine vehicle and then here recently went to a rear-engine drive. And I could define it for you. I could define the series. I could tell you what years they changed body styles. I can tell you which years are more popular than others. That's a definition of it. Would you like a definition of it today? Or would you like for a brand new Corvette to be parked out in the parking lot, I mean to toss you the keys, and say, here, go and experience it? I rest my case. I have to be honest with you, I've read lots of information on it, I've looked at it, I've gone in the showroom, and I've drooled over them. And I thought to myself, how impractical. What could you do with this? And then I thought, I could pull a trailer behind it. I could put a car carrier on a box on top of it, put everything in there, right? No, I'd rather experience the thing than talk about the thing. Hold on a second. Years ago, I had an opportunity in life to work for a gentleman who owned an apartment complex, and he would go out of town for a great deal of time, and he had a Porsche. And uh, that Porsche was, I I don't even remember the model number. It didn't mean that much to me, to be honest. I'm not much of a Porsche guy. But uh, he took, gave me the keys, and he said, hey, do me a favor. Drive that car around some, because it's really hard on it for it to sit here in this barn. How many of you like to have a job like that, right? Well, I was terrified of driving the thing. Would be, the, way, the way my life goes, I would total it the first time out, right? I'd scratch it pulling it in and out. So I occasionally I would take it out just a little bit, warm it up, drive it around. Well, there was a man in our church who's now with the Lord. His name is Tom Lott. Tom Lott was a big Porsche fan. And Tom found out about that, 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 that we had, that I had that portion, I had the keys to that. And he said to me, you know, you really ought to be a better steward. <laughs> that guy's asking you to drive his car. That car is, that car needs to be driven. You need to put it through the paces. I'd be glad to do that for you sometime. And I thought, well, how many of you remember Brother Tom? One of those people I look forward to seeing again someday, huh? Amen. And so he said, I'm going to come down from lunch one day and we're going to take that car for a drive. Okay. Well, he showed up, and I should have known that I was in trouble because he pulled out of his back pocket a pair of black leather gloves. And those leather gloves, they had holes where the knuckles go, and they were driving gloves, and he put them on. And then he put his sunglasses on, and he said, let's go for a drive. I said, you do realize my life, my job, everything is wrapped up in this drive right here. And we got in that car, and we hit I-65. Covered by the blood, all right? And he, went, he said, I know this perfect spot to really put this car through it. I said, oh, okay. We drove 65 to 465 East, and we got over, I think it's over about where 74 is at, maybe over that area. There's this thing like a clover, like a big circle. It's like a racetrack. And we went through that thing, and I, I, I believe we had it on two wheels at times. Man, I was white knuckling. I'm saying, Tom, Tom. Tom, Tom, and he was preaching, this is what this car needs. <laughs> this car was built for this, and we went through all that, and we got done. I said, you will never, and he said, I figured that, so I really got it. My, I got my ride in. <laughs> now, I can tell you about a portion, I can tell you that, but you know what? You got to experience it, right? I mean, that's really something else. I had a car. Another fellow who's with the Lord, Jerry Stogsdale. 
I had a 69 Ford Cobra, and I was babying it. And Jerry said, have you ever really driven this car like it deserves to be driven? And I said, Jerry, if we blow it up, I have to fix it. Well, we're not going to blow this thing up. Preacher, don't be a sissy. Come on, man. 429 Cobra Jet. He said, if I help you with that car, I'm driving that car. I said, all right, man. So he helped me. And then in my neighborhood, he hit that Ford 429 Cobra Jet and the four-speed that went with that thing, and we were going sideways through my neighborhood. Jerry was squealing. He was loving it. It had a bench seat. You know what happens on a bench seat when a car shifts that way? I'm in Jerry's lap. I'm saying, Jerry, stop. He said, listen, you, don't, you have no idea what you've got in this car. You need to drive this thing, right? Hey, listen, the love of God is better than those cars. And I can give you, and sometimes we look at this chapter as if it were a definition, but I don't think it's a definition. I think it's God being so gracious, perhaps one of the greatest passages of Scripture on that list, of God trying to show you what His love looks like. He wants you to experience it. This church in Corinth was lacking it. You know what? We, we lack love too. We're a generation that's very shallow. We see something, we want it, we buy it, even if we can't, even if we shouldn't, even if we have other things in our life because we like stuff and we take stuff. We want stuff. We're shallow in our love. We, we, we use something for a little while and when we're done with it, we throw it away. We throw our friends away. You can't help me anymore. You can't do anything for me anymore. If we're not careful in our family relationships, when somebody gets past the point of doing something for us, we're not considerate that way, we're shallow. You can look at me that way if you want to, but the reality is I know that not everybody in here perhaps is, but there is a level of that in our society. Would you agree with that? There are four Greek words that are used to describe love. Three of them are used in the Scripture, one is not. The first one that I'll introduce to you is a word that's not found in the Scripture. It's the word eros. It's named after the god, goddess, which there is no god and or goddess. There's one true god, but you understand. Named eros, and it speaks of erotic. It speaks of a self-gratifying, self-love, or a grasping. And that is where so many people live today. They are moved simply by flesh and simply by their passion. They want something, they take it without even considering the cost to other people. It is such a shallow fleshly love. And yet God designed us to be affected that way. And it's not sinful, it's what we do with it, and it's how we, where we remain with it if we stay in that. For example, when I saw my wife, when I was a senior in high school and she was a freshman in college and I saw her across the auditorium in church and I saw a young lady who was attractive to me, who was in church, who wanted to serve the Lord. You know what? I said, I, that, that pleases me. I like that. I, that's somebody that I would like to get to know. And I played it cool. <laughs> because to know me is to love me and as soon as she found out that I was interested, I would be... It would, be, I didn't want, it would be embarrassing for her, and I didn't want to do that to her, no. No. That's that little bit of how we look at things. That's kind of, you know, when Eve saw the fruit, that it was what? It was good, right? Who made the fruit? Of course it's good. God made it. That doesn't make it wrong. Just because God made something that looks good doesn't mean you have to take it. Because God had given specific command about it that what? That's my fruit. That's my tree. Don't touch it. You can eat all the rest of them but that one. But it looks real good. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you. There's a time and a place, and this is not the time and the place for that fruit, right? There's another form of love in the Scripture. It's used one time. It's used in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. It's used in a negative sense, not that it's bad, but the sense that it's used in. And describing what times would be like and how people would behave in the last days, how they would be traitors and heady and high-minded and lovers of selves and boasters and all those things. There's a statement that says that they would be without, they would have unnatural affection. Or they would not have natural affection, that they would lack that. 2 Timothy 3.3 3 says, without natural affection. Truce makers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. That expression, natural affection, is a form of the word love. It's the word love, storgy. I'm not trying to give you a Greek lesson because you don't need Greek to understand the Bible. But just like you and I use terms today, and we know what we mean by them, it helps us to understand a little bit of depth in that. For example, if you hear me say, man, that car is hot. 
That could mean a couple of things. Could mean that it's running over temperature. Are you saying, Pastor, that that car is hot and it's running over temperature? No. It could also mean that it's stolen. How many of you remember when you used to say that, right? Growing up in uh, northwest Indiana, the Chicagoland area, guys would show up at lunchtime and they'd say, man, I got a great deal on something. And I would say, really, is it hot? Meaning, is it stolen? And then I would say, does it have a serial number? Is it trackable? I'm just kidding. Uh, kidding. Kidding, Kevin. I'm kidding. All right, I'm just kidding. All right. Rain on my parade. It, it could mean it was hot that way, right? No, when I'm saying, man, that's a hot car. What am I saying? Man, that's a cool car. That's a neat car, right? A cool car? Hold on a second. You just said it was hot. Is it hot or is it cool? What is it, right? Love, like, you know, you, are, you, you have a pizza that you like. So, man, I really like that pizza. You might even go so far as, man, I love that pizza. You don't mean you love it in the same sense that you mean you love your family. Or you love the Lord. I hope you don't. Maybe you do. Maybe that's part of the problem. It's different in your mind, but it's different. So that word stored you there. It says without natural affection. There's a familial connection. When my six children were born, and I held them for the first time, nobody had to tell me or teach me or show me how to love them. God put something in my heart towards them. That's that natural affection, Right? That's that connection. That's why when the Bible says that there's going to be a day where people will be without natural affection. That's when they have those ties, those, ought, those, those natural ties that ought to bind us together when we don't. That's a mess. Then there's another form of love, and this is the one that you're oftentimes familiar with, these two terms you've heard, phileo. This is what Philadelphia was named after, the city of brotherly love. It speaks of friendship. It speaks of, I like you. This is the season for little candy hearts to get passed out, right? I'll admit it, when I was a kid, I wrote that note on occasion, do you like me? Circle, yes or no. Tell the truth. Um, those, you, you kids that have phones now, you have no idea the, the priority of the written word. You have no idea the... the the, the pressured, sweating moments that as a teenager I went through to write a note to a girl. I would write that thing, look at it, roll it up, throw it away. I gotta be, my penmanship's gotta be, it's gotta be nice. Now you guys send messages now. You, you speak to each other in hieroglyphics, right? Terms and three letter words that mean, I don't know what you're saying half the time, right? Anytime I try to be cool like that, I get in trouble. So you're not supposed to say that to people. I thought thumbs up was good, right? But some people say that giving somebody a thumbs up can be like you're being a punk to them and saying, hey, thumbs up, man. So whenever I do this, you just have to figure it out, all right? <laughs> man, you write that note and you pass that note over. Say, hey, man, did you slip this note over, you know, so-and-so? Do you like me, circle yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? Well, you got them back. Hey, two out of ten's not bad. I mean, come on. <laughs> hey, circle that thing, yes, it comes back. <laughs> right? That's that phileo love. I have friends. I have friends that I like. That's usually what friends, how you develop friendships with people. You have some kind of mutual connection with them, right? There's something you share an interest. I have friends in church. I have friends outside of church. I have people that I've met in the community who have some of the same interests and hobbies that I have, and the Lord has allowed me to develop friendships with them, healthy friendships where I'm able to introduce the Lord to them and the things of God and be who I'm supposed to be and come into that with that footing that way, but there's a friendship and a kinship there because we have a shared interest. There's a like. And that's, I would say to that person, and I, and I hope that they would even say to me, that, yeah, that's my friend. That's that brotherly friendship. And then there's a fourth word. And this is the one that you're probably most familiar with because it's, it's a real word that we throw around, even songs and things. That's the word agape. But here's the thing about the word agape. In a lot of the Greek writings where people who use the Greek vocabulary, they didn't like that word. I heard one guy say it, and I'm no expert to tell it, but I'll repeat what I've heard, and I, I didn't run it through Snopes, okay? But that really, in all historical Greek writings, they can only find very few occasions. See, some guys said even only one occasion where the word agape was even used. Because agape, in my opinion, is a radical love that is attached to God. By radical, I mean it is extreme. It is not phileo. It is not, I like you because you're nice to me. 
It is not I like you because you appeal to me. It is not I like you because we have shared interests. It is not storgy love and that, hey, we have a family connection and so we have that. It's a natural connection that we have to each other. It's not an eros and that I'm simply moved by the flesh. It is a love that is centered not on who you are, what you do for me, but it is a love that is centered on who I am and who I choose to be. That's God. This is the love that's described in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He what? That He gave His only begotten Son. This is the love that's described in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the love that's described in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth, God displayed, God revealed, God broadcasted, God in detail, God gave in a way that could be experienced so that you could understand God's heart towards you, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is that love. You see, this church in Corinth, they had gifts. They were out of sorts in their gifts. They were gravitating towards the gifts that made them seem important. They were gravitating towards the gifts that got them attention and popularity. They didn't even have a good grasp on gifts, and I could go through that with you, and I'm not. But they were making so much of self that it had become empty. And this is the direction that's given here. So oftentimes we'll take this chapter out, but when, when you put it in its context, you realize that it's the Lord dressing people down. It's the Lord saying to them, you are noisemakers. You are barrels who are empty. You are volumes of books who produce nothing. You are giving but for what reason? Because you're not doing it in love. I cannot tell you that when I surrendered to ministry as a teenager, I understood this love. I had heard of it. It had been defined. It was within me because this is the love that the Holy Spirit brings into our life. This is one of those fruits. This is His love, God's love. But this is a love that God wants to develop in our hearts and in our lives. This is a love that's necessary if our ministry, if our service to God, if our life in Christ is to be fruitful to the fullest capacity. This is one of those areas that we've got to grow in. This is an area that we need to be developed in. You see, they were priding themselves in what they could do for God and through God and not in the more excellent way. See, not everybody has the same gifts. In this particular assembly, there was a discussion there about apostles, and then there was prophets and teachers. We'll not get into these things and the role that they filled at particular times, but not everybody could be an apostle. Not everybody could be a teacher. Not everybody can be an administrator. Not everybody has this gift. Not everybody had, as we saw in Paul and Peter and certain ones in the book of Acts, that the gift of healing and miracles. So does that make people less significant that have lesser gifts or no gift? Is it good to want those gifts? Yeah, the Scripture says to covet them earnestly, to say, hey God, gift me so that I can be used by you. I desire, God, to be used by you. I desire what you would bring into my life so that I can accomplish your work. But for what end and to what reason? What is the message that God wants proclaimed? For God so loved. God is love. I don't mistake that. We'll conclude with this on what love is not. But this is what the world needs to hear. The world needs to know about God's love. They need to know what God's love looks like. They need to experience God's love. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you want. Love one another. You're going to be radically different than them. The Gentiles, they seek position. They seek power. They seek authority. You're going to be different. You're going to serve one another. That's why Jesus 
The Lamb of God, the just one, the just justifier, the man who, God man, who walked on this earth, who told the waves to cease and called the storms to be still, who proclaimed truth and the devils fled, who healed people. That's why the greatest teacher, the greatest master, the greatest rabbi that the Jewish people would ever experience and see walked into the midst of his students and stooped down and washed their feet in an act that to them culturally was for the least of people to do. And Jesus said, let me teach you something. Let me show you how people are going to know who we are. They're going to know who we are by how we operate. By the economy that we live in. By what we value. By what we see is important. And what we see is important is the love of God. And the proclamation of the love of God. Both through our words. But in our lives. In our homes. Husbands. Love your wives. As Christ loved the church. And gave himself for it. John 13, 34. Jesus said to the disciples. A new commandment. I don't want you just to love each other and love your neighbor as yourself. But now I want you to love your brother as I have loved you. Well, I don't really care how I'm treated. Okay, but Jesus treated me a certain way and that's how he wants me to treat others. To love others. Particularly my brethren. This church was right in some ways and wrong in others. And I believe that our love life, when it's out of sorts, can really play and wreak havoc in a lot of other areas. The first three verses, and I have to bring it to a close, of chapter 13, they speak to certain things. If you would allow me, just simply for time's sake. We've defined love. We see what this agape love, a a self-sacrificing, unconditional, consistent love is. God's love, charity. And I believe that God uses the word charity here in this chapter. It's not that it's not love. It's just that God is really keying in on this love and what this love looks like. When you think of charity, what do you think of? Giving. God's love to man is nothing but what? It's giving. All you've got, everything you've got, every good gift comes from above. God gave you life. God gave you all that you see. God gave you your life. Your existence is because, God, you're breathing today. Your heart is beating. Your brain is functioning. Your eyes are working today. God did all of that for you. God gives and God gives and God gives and God gives. And God is not giving based on the object. God gives and God loves because God is love. And so, three things here. First of all, I just, just as a real simple outline. We've defined love, but we've recognized the problem that these folks had with not loving as they should. And and then the the directive here is to to have this love. Because without love, and without functioning in this love, being empowered by this or motivated by this, we become mouths who do not have the, the whole message. We're lacking. So what if a person can speak and communicate it, but if there's no love... What is better? What what, what the Scripture is saying is it would be better for a person who cannot communicate as well, who does not have the gift of communication or the tongue gift, but love people and have the love of God, that is more excellent than simply having that gift. That means a Sunday school teacher who loves God, loves God's Word, loves God's people, and wants to feed them the Word of God is the more excellent way over the person who naturally is gifted to put a, have a lesson and throw a lesson out there and just jump into that lesson and put it out there. Which is better? Sometimes we overlook that love aspect. People know when they're loved. And when we communicate, we want our mouths to communicate from what? From a position of love. The love of God. Why do we say what we say? Do we say it so that we look good? Why am I preaching this sermon this morning? Am I preaching this sermon this morning for a paycheck? Am I preaching this sermon this morning so you'll think you'll be impressed by me so that I have some stature? Or am I preaching this morning because I love God and I love God's people and I want the love of God to be shed abroad in people's lives? 
Not only this, in verse 2 it says, if you had the gift of prophecy, if you had the gift of understanding, if you had a mind, mouth, mind, if you had a mind that had it all figured out, all there, what would it do? What status would you have if you did not operate and function in the love of God? What's it say? You may think you're something. You may think with that mouth that you sound like something, but without love operating through that, without love coming through that, it's just noise. You may think that you're something if you have all of these things in your head and you've got that gift and you might say, look at me, look at what knowledge I have. But if that's not the love of God flowing through that and coming and being a part of that, then what's the Bible say? You are nothing. I am nothing. Mouth, mind, and what's the third thing? Motive. So that's a word that's tough for us sometimes to see in the Scripture, but it's there. Look what the verse says, verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, hmm. and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me what? Nothing. Did you know that Christians aren't the only people who give everything to the poor? Did you know that Christians aren't the only people who give their lives to martyrdom? There are people who blow their lives up. They burn themselves alive for their cause. If I gave everything that I've got to feed the poor, if I gave my body to be destroyed, but I didn't do it because I love God and the love of God working through me, then what did I gain from that? Do you think that you'll get brownie points with God if you give everything away or allow your life to be destroyed? That gives us no standing with God. If God calls us to that, if that's the work that God calls us to, if that's the life and the death that God has for me, and I love Him and I submit to Him, that's a tremendous thing. But just to give it away so I can say, hey, look at me, I gave everything away. What'd you get from doing that? Look, I'm going to get martyred. For what purpose and to what end? Three things, and I'll leave you in closing here, that I think really speak to our love. My mouth, my mind, and my motives. My mouth, my mind, and my motives. My communication, the musings on my mind about who I am, how I see myself in regards to others even, and my motives. Why do I do what I do? Why don't I do what I ought to do? Love is not the absence of truth. Love is not the absence of discipline. This entire book was written to correct people. Verse uh, 33 and 34 of chapter 15, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Love is not saying to the world, just do it everyone, it's okay, we love you. It's like your doctor looking at your overall health. I walk in the doctor's office and I'm walking in with a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. And I'm drinking Red Bull. I got a pack of camels in one pocket and I got a can of snuff in the other pocket. I'm sitting in the office there. And the doctor says, man, I love you. I just love everything about you. You don't need to change a thing about anything you're doing. Well, you'd say, the doctor's not looking out for my health because obviously all of those things with the exception of Krispy Kreme donuts are a problem. <laughs> now, I put them all in there because everybody's got their, you know, they all have areas we need to be concerned about, right? You, the doctor says, I went to see the doctor and the doctor said, you're overweight. Who are you to talk to me like that? He's trying to help you, right? Doctor says you need to exercise more, but I mean, who doesn't, right? That's why one time a doctor said that to me. You need to watch your diet and exercise more. You say that to everybody. It doesn't mean anything. Come on. No, really. You need to. Shut up. <laughs> the doctor comes in and says, you know what? You've got some really bad things going on in your life, but you know, I just love you so much. I don't want to upset you. I don't want to hurt you. I, I would never want to disappoint you in me. And so you know, I just want to tell you that I love you. And I'm just thinking everything's going to probably, you know, love is going to pull us through. When you go out and you're a mess, you say, man, I ain't no doctor. That's not loving somebody to not try to help them. Now, what is important, right, when I speak truth, remember, it's to be done how? From a position of love. Because I love them. Because I love you, I want you to know this. Because I love you. Not because I want to get this off my chest. Not because I'm displeased or I don't like something, but because I love you, I want you to know truth. I want you to have correction in your life. You know, 
Love is not the absence of discipline. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth like a son. My parents disciplining me as a child, telling me no. I just don't want to ever tell my child no. Well, somebody else will. I don't ever want to discipline them. Somebody else will. I I mean, better coming from you because at least you love them. That second grade teacher don't love them. She may say she does, but there ain't no way in the world she loves them the way you love them. So you need to discipline them. Why? Because you love them. That's love, right? That's what this book is. So oftentimes we don't, we get, we don't know what love is. We've defined it. We don't see the priority of it. We've looked at the priority of it, no matter my mind, my mouth, my motives. And now we've considered what it's not. It's not an absence of that. What's the world need from God's people? Love. Biblical love. Speaking the truth in love. A heart that loves. Sincerely concerned. A love for God. And why should we love others? Because God loves them. God loves them. God is not willing that any should perish. But here's the problem with that. We are. God is not willing that any should perish. God wants all people to come to repentance. God wants all people to come to Christ. But our lives don't always reflect that about us, do they? We would say, oh, that'd be an awful thing for a person. Well, okay. Are you loving? Are you functioning and operating in that love? Are we being obedient to the call to take the truth to people? Or are we willing that people should perish? The love of God. We may come back to this tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Father in heaven, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And Lord, I trust that our hearts have been stirred by your word and by your spirit. Who would say this morning, preacher, there was something in that for me. Maybe it's recognizing God's love. Maybe today you're here and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Friend, if I could come to each and every person personally today, I would. I would sit with you and I would say, friend, God loves you. How do you know God loves me? I know God loves you because He gave His Son for you. He gave His best for you. I hope today that if you're not saved, that you would let somebody, there are men, there are ladies, they'd love to sit with you and show you from God's Word what the Bible says about eternal life and how you can know how you can know for sure when you die that you'll go to heaven, that you'll be in the presence of God. Heaven is a term that speaks of God's home, to be with God. Sometimes we would say to be right with God. How can a person be right with God? There's only one way to be right with God, and that's to come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you today right with Him? Are you saved? Do you know that? If you don't, won't you let somebody today share the gospel with you? The best news you'll ever hear. And if you're saved this morning, you say, Preacher, when I consider maybe even my mouth, my mind, and my motives, there is a definite room for improvement when it comes to loving like God loves and growing in that. Would you say, Preacher, please pray for me. There was something in that for me today. Several hands. I think this evening we'll come back to this and we'll experience the love of God, what that is. How it's, in, in a sense laid out for us. But today, maybe just ask the Lord to stir your heart in this, perhaps even to yield to the Spirit of God, that you'd like to see the love of God developed in you. I'm tired of loving only as Todd loves. I want to love as God loves. And I need the, the, the help of God to do that. We have some folks this morning who've trusted Christ. They're going to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. We're excited about that. Perhaps today you've been saved and not yet scripturally baptized, and you'd like to come today as well and get some explanation and direction on that. We'd be glad to help you. Maybe you have somebody you're praying for or a situation you're praying about. Why don't you let the Lord bring you and use you at the altar today to intercede on that. Whatever your need may be today, I trust you'll respond to the Lord. Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed.